Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today I have a very, very interesting video recommendation coming to me by a subscriber. We're going to react to Julius Evola on Buddhism. So now Julius Evola apparently was a Catholic scholar, however he was taught by a Sufi and now he's speaking on Buddhism. Really, really interesting subject. I'm looking forward to see this video. Let's have a look. Buddha is an outstanding example of a royal aesthetic. His natural counterpart in dignity is a sovereign who, like a Caesar, could claim that his race comprehended the majesty of kings as well as the sacredness of the gods who hold even the rulers of men in their power. If you believe the stories about the Buddha, he was born as a prince, so therefore yes, he would have that royal aesthetic by default. We have seen that the ancient tradition has this precise significance when it speaks of the essential nature of individuals who can only be either imperial or perfectly awakened. We are close to the summits of the Aryan spiritual world. Aryan. Being himself awakened, the Buddha wished only to encourage an awakening in those who are capable of it. An awakening, in the first place, of a sense of dignity and of vocation, and in the second, of intellectual intuition. A man who is incapable of intuition, it is said, cannot approve. The noble miracle conforming to the Aryan nature, as opposed to prodigies based on extra-normal phenomena, and considered to be non-Aryan, is concerned with this very point. What are we talking about in terms of Aryanism? Are we talking about the race Aryan here or what exactly? I'm curious to find out. The teaching stirs the faculty of discernment and furnishes a new and accurate measure of all values. We can see that the effective aim of Buddhism was to discriminate between different natures, for which the touchstone was the doctrine of awakening itself. A discrimination that could not do other than stimulate the spiritual bases that originally had themselves been the sole justification of the Aryan hierarchy. In confirmation of this- I really didn't expect this video to talk about Aryanism or the Aryan race in general, but that being said, the focus on awakening is of course the biggest difference between Buddhism and the Abrahamic faiths, for example. Especially if we look into Islam, we have the Quran and the Quran itself is the revelation from God. So therefore there is no awakening needed for you basically, other than to follow what has been revealed to the Prophet. With Buddhism, on the other hand, it is about the individual reaching nirvana, reaching enlightenment. It's the fact that the very, very establishment different. and diffusion of Buddhism never in later centuries caused dissolution of the caste system. Even today in Ceylon, the system continues undisturbed side by side with Buddhism. While uh, in Japan, Buddhism lives in harmony with hierarchical, traditional, national and warrior concepts. Only in certain Western misconceptions is Buddhism, considered in later and corrupted forms, presented as a doctrine of universal compassion, encouraging humanitarianism and right. democratic equality. That makes perfect sense to me. The same thing happened to the figure of Jesus Christ, of course, that is now displayed as this pacifistic hippie within the Western societies. Christianity in the beginning was of course discriminatory and wasn't this pacifistic religion that we see nowadays. But nevertheless, that being said, if we actually go into the roots then of Buddhism, Hinduism, I know they are not the same, but nevertheless, caste systems are mentioned. And this is why we see in India, for example, a great adoption of Islam, because Islam gives the people a fair playing ground, gets them out of the caste system and states that there is nobody better, not the Arab, not the black person, not the white person. Ultimately, it is about your piety. Buddhism is essentially aristocratic. We can see this in the legendary story in the canonical text where the divinity Brahma Sahampati, in order to induce Prince Siddhartha not to keep to himself the knowledge he had obtained, points out to him the existence of beings of a nobler kind, capable of understanding it. The Buddha himself finally recognizes this in these terms. <laughs> and I saw, looking at the world with the awakened eye, beings of noble kind and of common kind, acute of mind and obtuse of mind, well-endowed and ill-endowed, quick to understand and slow to understand, 
and many who consider that enthusiasm for other worlds is bad. Sure, that makes perfect sense as well. Talking to people that had certain like experiences, meditative experiences, ultimately many came to the conclusion that they are surrounded by NPCs. For people that don't know, NPCs are non-playable characters within a game, basically bots. You're surrounded by people that simply have not the same awareness like yourself. That means essentially that an awakened person is surrounded by people of lower consciousness that simply cannot grasp the same truths. I would say that this statement is correct, of course, because we are not equal. I said it before. If you look around, you see different heights, you see different weights, you see different levels of intelligence. So I fully have to agree with the statement of the Buddha. There follows a simile. As some lotus flowers grow in deep, muddy water, as others push up towards the surface of the water, yet others emerge from the water and stand up free from the water. Thus there are, in contrast to the mass of people, beings of a nobler kind. Sure, sure. Buddhism Absolutely. appeared in abnormal conditions in a particular traditional civilization. It is for this reason that Buddhism placed emphasis on the aspect of action and of individual achievement. And it is also for this reason that the support offered by tradition, in its most restricted sense, was held of little account. Prince Siddhartha stated that he himself had attained knowledge through his own efforts, without a master to show him the way. So, in the original doctrine of awakening, each individual has to rely on himself and on his own exertions, just as a soldier who is lost must rely on himself alone to rejoin the marching army. I absolutely love this perception. It is true in its core that we are born alone and we die alone. And ultimately, it is up to us to find the path to truth. I would claim the path to God, of course, even though that would disagree with Buddhism. Buddhism would claim the path to Nirvana. But be that as it may, the statement in itself is correct that it boils down to yourself. This reminds me of a talk that I had with a Buddhist monk in a Buddhist monastery here in Thailand roughly four, maybe even five years ago. The monk told me that ultimately he will have to transcend Buddhism as well. What does that mean? He said that even Buddhism in itself is a construct, is essentially like helping wheels, steering him into a certain direction. But if he really wants to reach Nirvana, then he will have to transcend Buddhism and he will have to let go of Buddhism ultimately. And this was the core of Buddhism that I got to know back in the day. It was about getting rid of all the concepts until nothing but the truth is left. Buddhism, if a comparison of various traditions were being made, could legitimately take its place with the race that elsewhere we have called heroic, in the sense of the Hesiodic teaching on the Four Ages. We mean a type of man in which the spirituality belonging to the primordial state is no longer taken for granted as something natural, that this tradition is no longer itself an adequate foundation. Spirituality has become an aim to him, the object of a reconquest, the final limit of a reintegration to be carried out by one's own virile efforts. And that is something that I come to disagree with now in the later stages of my somewhat young life. Back in the day, I really thought that everything that happens to me is due to my own efforts. And I made the statement previously that it will come down to you. However, nevertheless, I have to state that ultimately it is by the grace of God. This is really what I saw. Everything that is happening is happening for you. Everything that is happening, you are fully responsible. But at the same time, I saw that out of myself, I can cannot do anything. It appears that I'm doing something, but even the Quran states Allah guides who he wills. And therefore, I truly believe that everything good that happens within my life is by the guidance of God. Buddhism, of course, gets rid of that concept as well and simply focuses on the self and gets rid of God in totality. The recognition of that which is beyond both being and non-being opens to aesthetic exactly. realization possibilities unknown to the world of theism. The fact of reaching the apex, in which the distinction between creator and creature becomes metaphysically meaningless, allows of a whole system of spiritual realizations that, since it leaves behind the categories of religious thought, is not... 
That is exactly the statement that I just made. Buddhism in itself aims to transcend everything, even Buddhism within itself. Abrahamic faiths, on the other hand, do not seek to transcend the conceptualization of their own theology. That would be, of course, defying their purpose. Even if you go into the mysticism of the Abrahamic faiths, be it the Kabbalah, be it Christian mysticism, be it Sufism and whatnot, where people speak about the nature of non-duality, where everything merges into one, even there still we are holding on to God. God is the last frontier, so to speak, and we're not aiming to transcend God. We're not aiming to destroy that dichotomy. Easily understood, and above all, it permits a direct ascent, that is, an ascent up the bare mountainside, without support and without useless excursions to one side or another. This is the exact meaning of the Buddhist ascesis. It is no longer a system of disciplines designed to generate strength, sureness, and unshakable calm, but a system of spiritual realization. Absolutely. The test in Buddhism has various stages. From the most immediate forms of experience, the disciple proceeds to higher levels, to supersensible horizons, to universality, to celestial worlds, where the question is repeated, are you this? Can you identify yourself with this? Can you satisfy yourself in this? Is this all that you wish? The noble being always ends by answering in the negative. This is exactly what I was speaking of when I said that Buddhism aims to transcend everything and ultimately Buddhism itself. No matter which realization you come to have, you always have to transcend it yet again until nothing is left but I am. Spoiler here, that's the end of the journey. That is the end of the road in Buddhism. Ultimately, no matter which mental construct you see, you transcend it yet again. And therefore, to claim that Buddhism is pure idolatry would be wrong as well, because Buddhism understands that the golden statue is not the Buddha. They're not truly worshipping it. Of course, on a lower level, the common people, they might do that. That might be the case. But the higher class, the monks, etc., etc., they're not worshipping their statues as God. They don't even believe in God as such. They believe in being, in existence, and in non-duality, in transcending being in itself. So ultimately, no matter which mental construct a Buddhist holds, he has to transcend that as well. He has to ask himself basic questions. Am I this body? If not, what am I? He has to go further. Am I this soul? Is the soul not already a human concept? Is there a separation between my body and the external world? Until yet, Yet again, the Buddhist comes to the purest realization of I am. The revolution occurs. The disciple leaves his home, renounces the world, and takes the ascetic path. In Buddhism, the importance of the moment is stressed in every way. Knowledge in a text is likened to a flash of lightning. One is exhorted to rise and awaken when one perceives one's own passiveness, one's own indolence, without letting the moment pass. If the right moment is allowed to pass, that moment when one would have been able to overcome the force to which both men and gods are subject, the demon of death will reassert his power. One who is still an Aryan spirit in a large European or American city, mm. with its skyscrapers and So it is about race after all, huh? Asphalt, with its politics and sport, with its crowds who dance and shout, with its exponents of secular culture and of solar science and so on. Among all this, he may feel himself more alone and detached and nomad than he would have done in the time of the Buddha, in conditions of physical isolation and of actual wandering. The greatest difficulty in this respect lies in giving this sense of internal isolation, which today may occur in many almost spontaneously, a positive, full, simple and transparent character, with elimination of all traces of aridity, melancholy, discord or anxiety. Solitude should not be a burden, something that is suffered, that is born involuntarily, or in which refuge is taken by force of circumstances, but rather a natural, simple and free disposition. If you look into the prophets and the great teachers of this world, be it Buddha, be it Jesus, be it Muhammad, all of them fasted, all of them went into isolation, be it the desert, be it caves or whatnot. Isolation is the name of the game because you're shutting yourself off from the external world and like that you can focus inwards. Solitude is called wisdom. He who is alone will find that he is happy.
Alright guys, and this is it for today's video. Made me a bit nostalgic, I have to say. It reminded me of spending time within Buddhist monasteries, studying Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. And ultimately coming to the conclusion that I am is the truth, the I am awareness. But ultimately, now I'm sitting here and have to say that this was not fulfilling to me. This is why I kept on researching. The pure state of the I am awareness, the single state of being, being ultimately defied the purpose for me of what it means to be human. The pursuit of enlightenment, being detached from everything, defied the purpose of being human to me again. Because when you look at this creation, when you look at ourselves, once you remove every concept and you remove yourself from what it means to be human, then you're left in a very, very lonely place with no meaning by default. And I believe that everything we do in this life must have some sort of meaning otherwise we get lost the human existence itself functions within hierarchy you have a hierarchical structure within society you have it within family as well and the same applies of course to our position in this realm to God. God is above everything. God is beyond everything. God is the highest value that we should worship. If you remove God from the equation, then you are highly likely into worshiping yourself one way or the other. And this can, in the long run, feed the ego again. But even if you're not feeding your ego, you're removing yourself from the purpose of being a human being. And if I look around, this creation, call it a game if you will, has been created with a purpose. If you defy the purpose, what is left? Absolutely nothing. You're just a mere wanderer, a vagabond that cannot be in a place and be a father, for example, which was extremely important to me. You cannot be a son any longer. You're completely removed from every conceptualization and with that you are left in the dark. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. Please let me know in the comment section what you guys think about this. What is the purpose for a human being? Is it really to transcend everything, to become enlightened, or is it to worship a god? Let me know in the comment section. I would really love to discuss this with you. Guys, if you like this video, leave the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support my channel via Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.